Hello, my name is Annabel Harsing and I'm a professor, research mentor and staff development lead at Middlesex University London. Welcome to this presentation on improving your research profile, reputation and impact. This presentation consists of eight sections that can be watched as freestanding videos or as part of a long playlist. This is the eighth and last session of this presentation. It first of all includes some evidence that sharing your research on social media works and provides some tips for those who are all a bit overwhelmed by all that has been presented, which I can imagine will be many of you. Now, this is the last part of the eight part uh, presentation and the earlier parts explains why building your research profile is so important, what the impact is and why you should care about it. Uh, we then had three sessions focusing on citation impact. Um, I also gave you a crash course on data sources and metrics. I explained how you can find your citation record in the Publish or Perish software and how ethical and professional behavior can improve both your citations and other types of impact. The last three parts of the presentation were all about creating research profiles and uh, using social media, including a very practical uh, seven step process. And if you've missed any of them, do have a look at them as there are plenty of screenshots with examples for each step. In this last part of the presentation, I will first show you some evidence that sharing your research on social media does help in generating impact. And I will also provide you with a guide of how time poor academics can make strategic decisions about which type of social media platforms to engage with. Now, before we start, um, some quick words about open science. What is open science? It's, it's the next big thing in academia. It aims to make scientific research accessible to everyone so that everyone in society can benefit from our research. And it's, it's entirely consistent with and in fact amplifies everything suggested in this presentation. This whole presentation was about building your research profile, reputation and impact and open science helps you doing this. Um, I won't be able to cover this topic in any detail in this presentation, but I just wanted to alert you to the fact that we will soon get more information about transitional agreements with publishers, which will allow you to publish your articles open access for free. If you have any questions about this topic, please do contact the Middlesex University Research Support Team. They also run regular uh, seminars on various aspects of open science and provide very useful guides. Here are two guides on, on open access and research data that they've recently published. Now I can well imagine that some academics listening to this presentation will think, oh my God, this is all too much. They're not enough hours in the day. I have so much other work to do. But honestly, this is not as time consuming as you may think. If you add up the hours, I would say that per paper is about six to 16 hours. That might still sound like quite a lot for an individual paper, but put this into context. You've spent years and years on this research and then another year or two writing up the paper and getting it through the review process. Why wouldn't you spend one or two more days to make sure that your paper reaches the audience it deserves? Um, in the social sciences and humanities, we are at an advantage because it's not like we're publishing 10 articles a month. If you do, yes, then this would be quite time consuming. But then you're probably leading in a laboratory and you have a, a group of junior colleagues who, who do all the social media outreach for you. Generally, academics in the social sciences and humanities publish a couple of articles a year at most. So it, it really doesn't have to cost more than a few days a year. And, and as I said, if you put all this time into getting a paper out there, why not make sure it gets the, the attention it deserves? So the other question people always have is, well, does it really matter? I've presented some of this material before and, and some people have said to me, well, I've never ever cited a paper because I read, I, I read a tweet about it. Well, maybe you didn't, but that's anecdata. That's not research. And there's in fact lots of research on social media use in academia. And in general, you will find that the more you engage with social media, the more your work is read. Even if you reach a dozen people that really need to know about the research, I think it's worth it. 
And as I said before, this is not all about citations, it's about reaching the right audience with your work. Then if you're still not convinced, I'll give you two very clear examples of my own work that are as close as we can get to controlled experiments. One relates to two articles published on the same topic in the same special issue sharing one author and we'll look at citations. And the other one relates to six articles published online in the same journal around the same time and we look at the number of reads. So here's a first example of the impact of using social media to communicate about your academic research. Here is a search in Publish or Perish for the articles published in a special issue in Journal of International Business Studies on language and international business. One of my frequent co-authors, Marcus Pudelko, who is not a big fan of, of social media, uh, published two articles in this special issue in this journal. Both articles are with uh, one of the then junior colleagues in his uh, team, Helena Tenzer and Stefan Volk, um, and with an external co-author, myself and Tina Köhler, a former colleague of mine at the University of Melbourne. And both articles were excellent, otherwise they wouldn't have been accepted by the journal, which is a, a very top journal in, in my field. But whereas uh, Helena and myself uh, did share the article repeatedly on social media and we also shared it in our own network of colleagues by email, the other article was pretty much left to its own devices. The difference in citation rate is striking. The first article is the most cited article in the special issue altogether and is cited almost four times as much as the other article. Now, the previous example related to articles published nearly eight years ago. Obviously, over that time, there are a lot of factors that might have influenced citation counts. So this next uh, example looks at um, articles that are not yet published in print, but have been made available in online first. Now, they're all articles published in the same journal, Journal of International Business Studies, which again is a top journal in international business and one of the top journals in business and management more generally. I looked at the number of times this, uh, the articles were accessed 10 days after they appeared online. So this is an early measure of impact as academics accessing the article are likely to read it and then possibly cite the article in the future. Now, all of these articles meet the stringent evaluation criteria of this journal and many of them were written by well-known academics in the field of international business. I'm sure they're all fantastic articles. You will know that some of the articles are research notes rather than full articles or they're part of a point-counterpoint discussion series or they're a retrospective reflecting on winning the Decade Award for a particular paper. However, I would not expect these different types of articles to have dramatically different access counts and if anything, people might be more inclined to access shorter articles, retrospectives or articles that are part of a topical discussion rather than a regular article. However, as you can see, after 10 days, their access counts are dramatically different. We can clearly see that there are two factors that seem to influence these access counts. First of all, whether or not an article is available open access, and this is indicated by a, a dashed black um, corner around uh, the uh, article. Um, this means that the full article can be read and downloaded by everyone, regardless of whether someone is working at an institution that has paid for a subscription to the journal. But even if someone is working at a well-resourced university that has lots of journal subscriptions, they might still be more likely to access the article if it's available in open access, as it means they don't have to log in to the library system and, and, and remember their password and everything. Um, so. As you can see, the first article on the slide is available in open access and has had more than 200 access counts in only 10 days, which is quite a respectable number. And then the second factor that might influence whether people uh, access an article is whether authors of the article or other people have shared, shared the article on social media, the topic we're discussing today. And this is indicated by a red border. Um, 
you can see that looking at something that's called the alt metric score. So this basically measures how often an article has been shared on Twitter, LinkedIn, Mendeley, whether it's mentioned in a newspaper or, or any other non-academic outlet. So this is an alternative to citations in, in, in terms of attention for the article. Uh, as you can see, the second article has an altmetric score of 8, which means that there have been 8 instances of sharing in, in those 10 days. And this article also has more than 200 access counts in, in only 10 days. Now, there are three other articles, all with a light grey border, that are neither available in open access, nor do they have a significant altmetric score. And they all have access scores that are only about a third uh, of the other two articles. And then finally, there's the last article, which is uh, my own article, which is both available in open access and has a significant altmetric score. And it has an access count of more than 600. So that's three times as much as the articles that had either open access or social media sharing, and nearly 10 times as much as those that had neither. Um, so, as I mentioned before when I discussed open science, there can be a multiplier effect. If your article is available with open access and you do engage in sharing on social media, the number of people accessing it might increase rapidly. Now, whether this will translate to higher citation levels remains to be seen, but, but even if it doesn't, we need to remember that this is not the main purpose of sharing our work widely. The main purpose is to ensure that the article is read by as many people as possible. So, what's the point of publishing articles if nobody reads them? After all that work and, and blood, sweat and tears that we've put into doing the research and getting the article through many, many rounds of revise and resubmits, surely you would want to ensure it is read by others. Um, of course, there's no guarantee that these, these early differences after only 10 days will be persistent. Uh, for instance, the two articles about case study research on the bottom row were part of an AIB uh, Academy of International Business webinar the week after I collected this data. And their access levels have increased the days after uh, this was announced. But this only proves the point in a way, because these articles were accessed more because there was publicity about them. Now, what if you feel you really can't spare any time on this? Now, here is what I suggest. Um, I suggest you take a two-year plan in which you only spend one or two hours a month. And obviously this is just a suggestion, it's not a straitjacket. Modify it to, to serve your own preferences and situation. However, I do think that, that, that everyone um, who, who takes their academic career seriously should be able to invest one hour a month to build their own professional reputation. After all, this is, this is not something you're doing for your university, you're doing this for your own transferable professional reputation. As I said, your first profile should really be your staff profile. So that should take less than an hour. So you can do that in the first month. And then in the second month, um, I would suggest you create a Google Scholar profile and a LinkedIn profile. Combined, they should not take you more than an hour. In fact, you can do a Google Scholar profile in maybe five to 10 minutes and a basic LinkedIn profile in 30 minutes if you have a bio ready. Then in the third month, I suggest you create a basic ResearchGate profile to share full text versions of your paper. Again, this shouldn't take more than an hour, probably much less so. From then on, you only need to maintain these four platforms. For instance, uploading a paper takes less than five minutes on ResearchGate if you have prepared the pre-publication version, which you need to do anyway for your university repository. Uh, so in the rest of the, the first year, you could spend a bit more time every month improving just one of the four profiles, filling out more sections, following some of the tips in my blog posts that are linked on this slide. Simply continue as long as you feel that there are still things to do. So that way, by the end of the year, you will have four very solid profiles by spending an hour or less each month. 
Then in a second phase, maybe in, in the second year or whenever you're comfortable with these four platforms and you don't need to spend much time improving them anymore, you might want to start engaging a bit more with them. Uh, you could create a few Google Scholar alerts uh, to, to follow other academics work or, or simply get an alert um, to new citations for your own work. Uh, as an early career researcher, there's nothing like receiving a Google Scholar email in the morning showing that a key scholar in your field has cited your work. That will boost your confidence for the whole day, if not the whole week. Um, you can find all the information on how to do this in the linked blog post on, on Google Scholar. Uh, you can also start uh, to share some updates about your work on LinkedIn, maybe once a month or so. Or if you haven't published anything yet, simply practice by sharing interesting research in uh, your research area or by sharing blog posts or, or news items um, in, in your research area on one of, of your colleagues. That way you can start building a, a reputation as someone working in this research area, even if you haven't published much yet. My blog post about LinkedIn provides you with a lot more details on, on how you can use this platform effectively. And then for ResearchGate, you would obviously want to upload every new paper, but you could also have a look at your feed, which, which shows you who has published new work in your area, who has been reading and, and citing your work, or, or you could have a look at your monthly <coughs> statistics. Um, for instance, ResearchGate shows you um, how often your papers are viewed or cited and how this is developing over time. I wouldn't really encourage you to get too focused on this, but it, it's, it's nice to look at these occasionally. Again, um, my blog post about ResearchGate provides you with lots more detail on how you can use this, this platform effectively. So that's the first two years done. Now, after the steps I described in the previous slide for the first two years, you will be very comfortable with interacting on three key platforms, Google Scholar Profiles, LinkedIn and ResearchGate. If that's sufficient for you, feel absolutely free to stop there. But if you find you're starting to like using social media to build your research reputation, what else uh, can you do? Well, I, I would suggest that maybe you start um, to do guest blogging, maybe once or twice a year. The first time you, you write a blog post, it might take you four to six hours, or maybe even a full day. So if your time is limited, you wouldn't want to do this more than once a year. But the more you write, the quicker the process will be. So you may, might end up posting a few times a year or, or even a bit more frequently. Then another option would be to open a Twitter account. And <laughs> like many of you probably, um, I thought Twitter was utterly stupid when I first heard about it. And I thought it was only about third rate celebrities tweeting about what they had for breakfast. Uh, but it is the platform that has surprised me most. I can get quite a lot of academic news through Twitter these days, including relevant new papers in my field, special issues, conferences, or new developments in the area of research evaluation or open science. And remember, you can, you can follow professional organizations and conferences and journals, as well as individuals. And of course, you can also follow organizations and people outside academia, which is great for external engagement and impact. Remember, you don't need to be glued to your, your Twitter feed. In, in fact, I would strongly recommend you switch off notifications. You just log in once a week and check the Twitter accounts of some key organizations and individuals you are following. Now, if you like, you can react to some tweets of others. You can like them, you can retweet them, or occasionally send a tweet yourself with an article or a blog post you found interesting, or announcing a new paper by yourself. But you don't have to do that. You can also use Twitter purely for information gathering. Obviously, that won't help you to build a research reputation, uh, but only actively engage with Twitter if it serves you. You don't have to do it. 
Uh, there are two linked blog posts which will give you more information about Twitter and blogging. Uh, and again, for all of these links, if you have access to the slide, just click on them to go to the relevant web page. If you don't, just Google the title of the blog post and maybe add the name of my website www.harsing.com and it will be in the first research, uh, search results. Then um, after a while uh, you find you're starting to really like doing this, you can always start to engage a bit more intensively. You, you could start to do regular blogging or start your own blog. You could start using Twitter more actively or have multiple accounts for multiple purposes. Maybe one for yourself, one for your research cluster you're involved in. Uh, you could comment on, on LinkedIn updates of others more frequently. You could regularly share articles or posts on LinkedIn yourself, but that's all up to you. And remember, this is not a once and for all, uh, sorry, a once and forever choice. Feel free to take a break from social media for a few weeks or even a few months um, if your work is really busy. Or if you just want to hide in your own little world for a while, we, we all have periods like that. So nothing is compulsory. Your social media engagement should really be meaningful to you. Uh, so don't engage in, in mindless scrolling or, or frantic exchanges. It won't do your mental health any good. Even more so than when using social media privately, when using it professional, it should be purposeful. Make it work for you. Don't let yourself be driven by these platforms. Now, finally, before we end this session and the presentation as a whole, I would like to express a little word of caution. Uh, an academic career requires a large variety of skills. It seems that these days we need to be a groundbreaking researcher, publishing constantly in top journals, bringing in bucket loads of research funding, be an aspiring teacher who is not only entertaining and enlightening their students, but also being scrupulously fair whilst caring for students' individual differences and providing past pastoral care at the same time. And on top of that, Many of us need to be effective, efficient, politically astute and inclusive academic administrators or managers. And now I'm telling you in this presentation that you also need to pay attention to your research profile, reputation and impact, ensuring your work not only has academic impact in terms of citations, but also external impact in terms of uh, external impact through external engagement. And I fully agree that all of these activities are important in academia, but we can't expect every single academic to do all of these things equally well and, and all at the same time. Indeed, universities need to fulfill all of these activities, but it doesn't mean every single individual academic needs to do all of these, certainly not at every single stage of their career. Even just focusing on the research sphere, not all academics can be expected to be equally good or even willing to engage with, for instance, practice. Uh, the ability to combine rigorous research with practical relevance often really requires a lot of experience. Or engaging with traditional media, um, such as radio or television. Public appearances can be very time consuming and can completely displace our other work. Or even social media, not everyone is willing to put themselves out there. There are real issues with privacy and online abuse. And some academics are simply technophobes. I don't think it makes any sense forcing people to do this, although I would argue that everyone should probably have a basic staff profile, a Google Scholar profile and a LinkedIn profile. And then finally, we also do need to acknowledge that external engagement is a lot easier for some personalities than for others. Many researchers are strong introverts whose creative energy can be seriously drained by too much interaction. I see some of my more extroverted colleagues thriving on attending networking events and, and working closely with business through action research and consultancy. For me, as a very strong introvert, engaging in these type of activities would drain me so much that I wouldn't have energy for anything else for a few days. 
But many countries are, are currently seeing a re-evaluation of academic careers in which there's more recognition for teaching, leadership and external engagement rather than only careers based on research. And I think that's a very, very good thing. So that was the end of part eight of this eight part presentation series. It's been nearly three hours of recording and I'm exhausted and you are probably too. But I do hope it has been useful to you and it has motivated you to try out some of the things that I have suggested for yourself. If you're keen to learn more, here are a range of readings that might be helpful to you. The first set are about improving and demonstrating your research impact. The next set are about improving your research profile and reputation. Then I've also created two collator pages on internal promotion applications in academia and avoiding desk rejects that might be useful to you too. For all of these links, if you have access to the slides, you can just click on them to go to the relevant web page. If you don't, just Google the title and you will find them easily. If you're watching this presentation from outside Middlesex University, I wish you all the best in building your research pro uh, profile, reputation and impact and lots of fun. Please do leave your comments on YouTube if you found this useful. If you're watching this in preparation for a flipped classroom session at Middlesex University, I really look forward to seeing you at the session and discussing the questions you might have. See you soon.